Okay, perfect. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. Pero, Jimmy, ven. <laughs> Le cambiaste el video. Esto es que no, que yo quería tener el speaker's view en que se ve la próxima diapositiva. Gracias. Oh, Gracias. Oh, hello, everybody. How are you doing? Good. Good. Okay. So we are coming to the end of the eighth symposium on language research on. <laughs> and this end cannot be better. Dr. Ophelia Garcia and Dr. Ricardo Otegui uh, from the City University of New York. It's such a huge honor for me to um, introduce them. After having read and reread and studied and internalized their articles, having them in person is unbelievable. There is nothing I can say to introduce Ophelia Garcia and Ricardo Otegui that hasn't been said before. Their research and especially their passion and advocacy for translanguaging, bilingualism, minoritized communities and children, among many other relevant topics, stand for them. I hope that you enjoy the presentation as much as I'm going to. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here today and thank you especially Professor Agustina Carando and Professor Margarita Jimenez Silva for esta invitación. This is a very nice invitation. We are very happy to be here. And thank you, of course, to the students who've organized this. These joint departmental things are extremely important. And uh, I am very grateful to you for having organized it and for having invited us. We are going to be speaking, as the, the slide says, about centering minoritized bilingual speakers. And this is going to be uh, a dos voces. It will be two voices. I will speak and then Ophelia will speak. And we come from different worlds. I come from the world of linguistics. Ophelia com comes from the world of education. And we are going to try to change things a bit. And instead of talking about the language of Latino bilingual speakers, we are going to be speaking about them. We're going to be speaking about the speakers themselves. That's the goal. And the consequence of adopting that goal, we think, is that one can come to very different understandings of language, bilingualism, and education. So that's the idea. See what happens when one begins to talk not about the bilinguals languages, but about the bilinguals themselves. That's, that's the, uh, the idea. And Linguistics and bilingualism, I would say the perhaps the main contribution of linguistics to the study of bilingualism has been the notion of language contact. And the theory of language contact is about languages, it's about named languages coming into contact, okay? Spanish and English in the case of interest here. But we're interested in speakers, not in languages. So let's let's see how, how this works out. The two main constructs that linguistics has contributed in the field of language contact to the study of bilingualism has been, of course, or have been the notion of loan words, the notion of loan constructions, which are manifestations of language contact. So linguistics contributes to the concept of language contact. And these two things, loan words and loan constructions, are the two main manifestations of language contact, as all of you know. So let me then look at a speaker rather than the languages. And let me take a look at Altagracia Ramirez. You can tell by her name that she's a Dominican. All the Dominicans are named Altagracia. Or at least if you see an Altagracia, it's very likely she's a Dominican. This is all, of course, from the perspective of New York City. I have to say that because as you know, we suffer from the greatest provincialism in the world, namely New York City provincialism. So all I'm doing is speaking from the point of view of New York, which we all make it appear as if it were universal, even though it is not. 
Altagracia is born in New York, 1998, and she has a Dominican mother and a Puerto Rican father. So she is what one calls a native bilingual, a second generation bilingual. And let's talk about those phenomena that are part of what the theory of language contact tells us are characteristic of Altagracia. And let's talk about loan words in Altagracia. Ponlo en el counter por ahora. Counter is said to be a loan word coming from the English word counter. Lo tenía en el basement del building. Basement and building are said to be loan words from English building and, uh, and basement. Tenemos un appointment para las cuatro, a very widespread loan word. Su hijo ya tiene edad para estar en high school. High school is a long word in, is said to be a long word in the Spanish of, uh, of New York and in the Spanish of Altagracia. And so is the word bill from the English bill. Um, and if we want to talk about long constructions in Altagracia, typical examples given are things like, ese dinero es para que lo compra mañana. Okay, and for those of you who know Spanish, that is surprising because one, one would expect ese dinero es para que lo compre mañana. We'll go into that a little bit more. And mi amiga se enamoró con él is said to be a loan construction because it is said that in Spanish one says se enamoró de él. So this is the wrong preposition and it is the wrong tense in the previous, in the previous sentence. This is the way it is presented normally. These are long words that you can, you can tell are long words because they come from another language. They're not Spanish. You can tell the long constructions because they are not the way that Spanish is built in its grammar. And let's see about some problems with this concept in Altagracia. Um, let me first tell you that these words and constructions have been part of Altagracia's language from earliest infancy, okay? She learned counter, leche, libro, milk, basement, building, perro, together. These words were not learned, some of them first, like perro and leche, and then the long words. The psycholinguistic evidence says that these words, that, that these words are almost certainly represented in the same cognitive box. Namely, when psycholinguists, as you know, have tried to make bilinguals behave experimentally in such a way that they show that they have two lexica. Every time they try it, what they find is that they have to have resort to no notions like simultaneous activation, which means that everything is in fact happening in the same, in the same representational storage. Also important, she always said, para que lo compra and se enamoró con él. She never said, para que lo compre and se enamoró de él. So the question that arises is, these are loans from whose perspective? Obviously these are loan words and loan constructions from the perspective of the language, but they're not so from the perspective of Altagracia. And this is serious because once you take the notion of the loan word and the loan construction, which as you know, were developed for historical research, People who are interested in the history of Spanish uh, will tell you that, that football, the most common word in Spanish, is a loan word. And so if you're studying history, then that's fine. But the notion of the loan word and the loan construction have seamlessly, seemingly seamlessly passed on to the study of individuals. And once you begin to describe the words of the individual, that the, ones, the, the words the individual has had from birth, once you begin to say some are loans, some are not. Now what you're beginning to say is that some of the linguistic competence of this speaker is not quite legitimate. It is not quite belonging to that speaker. It is somehow from outside that speaker. And that is a very dangerous move to, to make if one is interested in the speaker. In other words, this notion of loan, which was so good for studying the language's history, we have imported it for the study of individuals, and this has become quite dangerously in that it immediately legitimizes part of, of their language. Altagracia got a job and went to college, and she learned many new and strange words and phrases. She learned the word sotano, edificio, cuenta, mostrador, turno, bachillerato, secundaria, instituto, prepa, para que, and she learned that people say para que lo compre mañana with a subjunctive, not with an indicative. And she learned that people that she began to interact with 
the professors in college, the tourists that she worked with in her job, or the co coffee import company that she began to work, say, se enamoró de él. So I say to you, which are the long words, not in Spanish, but in Alta Gracia? Seems to me that these words that are said to be the correct Spanish words, these are the loan words in Alta Gracia. So this notion of the loan has in fact gotten things bollocked up because now the words that are native to Alta Gracia and are her own language have become labeled as outsider words that belong to somehow from somewhere else. And then when she, in many cases, this happens in New York, when she learns all these new words from the Latin American customers or from the Latin American tourists or from the Latin American or Spanish professors, all of a sudden, these are said to be the real, no, how can they be the real words? She just learned them when she was 18. So I want you to see how, whether you take the language's view or the speaker's view, you begin to see things a little differently. And I ask you here, which one is the real loan in Alta Gracia? Is it basement? Is basement the loan or is sotano the loan? Is B the loan or is cuenta the loan? Is it high school or is it instituto? It seems to me that if we are going to continue to use this term loan, we need to think about this um, very, very um, carefully. The reason we have to think about it carefully is because, as you know, there's an entire field of research devoted to the notion of divergent acquisition or incomplete acquisition. And some of these words, and especially some of these constructions, are given as evidence that Altagracia did not acquire her language completely. Now, mm -hmm. magically, she lived with two monolingual Dominicans who spoke only Spanish until the age of five. And by age five, as far as I've heard, every human being acquires a language completely. But somehow we've managed to get into this rut, I think, of thinking that people like Altagracia have an incomplete language. And the evidence is these kinds of, of uh, loan constructions and these kinds of loan words. So I am now asserting for you my position that Altagracia's acquisition is not incomplete. It is not divergent. Basement building high school are not divergent or incomplete forms of sotano, edificio, and instituto. And the phrase, the, the prepositional phrase with the indicative complement, para que lo compra mañana, is not an incomplete or somehow divergent version of para que lo compre mañana. And the prepositional choice of se enamoró con él is not divergent or incomplete from se enamoró de él. For the simple reason that this is the way she learned to speak from the, the, from the get go. And I put it in blue to make the bold assertion, which in fact is a very simple assertion that everybody I think will acquiesce to. No native speaker acquires their language incompletely or divergently. A native speaker produces a grammar, induces the grammar. That grammar is represented in the brain of that, in the mind of that speaker by the age of five or six. To be sure, some things are missing. There, there are lots of things that are acquired later. But by the age of five, I think most linguists will agree there is a fully represented grammar in the mind of the speaker, and therefore it cannot be incomplete or divergent. And so we are speaking of second generation speakers born in New York, people who have lived with th these constructions and these words from the very beginning. And it seems to me that we are not quite understanding things if we say that these grammars are incomplete or divergent. And notice what I didn't say. I didn't say it is not fair to Alta Gracia. It is not a, a re, it is not the right thing to do. It is not insulting her. No, I'm telling you that it is not reasonable. It absolutely makes no sense to say that someone has an, a divergent or incomplete grammar. This is why the label of heritage speaker is misleading in my mind. I know that it, we all use it and that it has been useful in many ways, but it makes the suggestion that there are two kinds of native speakers the regular ones and the heritage ones. And I've, I think that that has led to a certain amount of confusion in the minds of the analysts. So I, I would say the term heritage speaker has been a, a little um, helpful in some cases, but not so helpful in others. 
So that's point number one. Now I wanna make a second point. And the second point is going to be uh, relying on the notion of translanguaging. That I think many of you have been reading about and, uh, and hearing about. And translanguaging, translanguaging theory has many aspects, educational ones and so forth. The main point uh, from the linguistic point of view is the, the position that is taken with respect to bilinguals. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that now. Okay, so the first thing to know is that we can have an ontology, as you know, that means what exists from the speaker's perspective. And let's read this, this um, slide for a minute. The words Arabic, Bulgarian, English, Spanish, Navajo, etc., are the names of social and political entities. That's point number one. These words do not refer to a cognitive reality. They, they refer to a social reality. That's the first thing we need to know. And it's a social reality that, as, as we know, has been invented sometimes very recently. The names of the languages of Africa, for example, Sintri Makoni tells me that these languages were invented, literally invented by the English colonial authorities. Same with the languages of India, same with the languages of, of uh, Latin America, the indigenous languages of Latin America. So these terms like Quechua and Guarani and so forth are names imposed upon reality by people who were observing missionaries, colonial authorities, and so forth. So these things are social and political entities. And like most social and political entities, they're subject to contestation. We have a right to contest them and we have a right, and people do, that's, why, that's how they can say Altagracia is not speaking Spanish. If you say se enamoró de con él, that's not Spanish. Well, that shows you right there that the label Spanish is a contestable one and people contest it in the case of Altagracia. So these are terms that are social inventions that have to do with power relations. They are not, I say in the second line, the names of cognitive lexical structural entities. The only cognitive lexical structural entities are the speakers, phonemes, morphemes, words, constructions, meanings of those words and construction, constructions, etc. Here's the point. When someone says, you know, a, a label like Bulgarian or Arabic or Spanish is a social invention, it is in fact in the realm of society, it is not a cognitive reality. People say, wait, well, so don't, don't people have a language in, don't you think that people have a language in their mind? Well, I do, some people don't, but I do. I think there is a linguistic competence, but that linguistic competence consists of whatever, of whatever your linguistic theory says it does. Phonemes, morphemes, words, you have rules, there are rules. If you have movement, there is movement. If you have constructions, those things are real and cognitive. But the grouping of those things and the labeling of those things as Spanish or English or Bulgarian or Hindu or Igbo, those things are of a social nature. So I'm trying to get you to see that there are two kinds of existences. There is a social existence of the label and there is the cognitive existence of these machinery that people have. Uh, I then say, but these things do not exist in the native language. They are part of the speaker's total repertoire. And I remind you on the last line, the trans in translanguage means going beyond. In other words, translanguage in theory is an attempt to think beyond the boundaries of the name language, which have been encasing our thinking. And we're trying to go uh, uh, beyond that. Translanguaging and the bilingual speaker's repertoire Number one, the repertoire of the bilingual is not divided into two separate components. Bilinguals do language with a unitary repertoire. Whoa, what, what does that mean? Well, it, it's in fact not a very controversial proposal. It says that when we say that someone speaks Spanish and English, given that we agree that Spanish and English are social inventions, that the only thing that's real is the <coughs> rules of that person not the rules of Spanish, the rules of that person, the phonemes of that person, the morphemes of that person, then a person who, who is said to speak two languages, it is a completely a priori assertion to claim that they have two linguistic systems. We know they have lots, many more linguistic features than the monolingual, but the idea that they're neatly arranged into two separate representations is, and a priorism in linguistics. The idea that the bilingual is cognitive bilingual is an a priori, it's, it's an a priori assertion. So translanguaging theory says 
what, you, what we have in the bilingual is a single repertoire, which when produced, when externalized, okay, that single representation gets labeled by the society in, in, in different ways. So there is no English cognitive compartment separate from Spanish cognitive compartment. There's no dual language competence. The bio bilingual is a social reference. In other words, the speaker, of course, can speak to lots of people. And it, we say of that behavior that it is the behavior of a bilingual because the society has created these two labels. But in fact, what we have as a representation is almost certainly a single representation that the speaker, um, th that I call a, a, a unitary competence. The psycholinguistic evidence for this, again, is very strong, I think, in that it is very hard to get bilinguals to behave as if they had two separate representations. Brain imaging research at NYU shows how difficult it is for people to do what I'm doing now. In other words, for me to be speaking and making sure that because this is a college lecture, I am going to be using what my society calls English only, that apparently from what the psycholinguists tell me is quite a job for the brain. What the brain wants to do, this is what the psycho psycholinguists tell you, what the brain wants to do is switch languages easily. No. If that is what the result of the research shows, then it shows that the bilingual is not switching languages. What the bilingual is doing is relying on a single representation that when, when it becomes externalized is labeled as switching, okay? So that's the idea of the translanguage inquisition. And it's the focus on the speaker and not on named languages. And my last slide, not the last of the talk, my last slide is, I have questions for you. What are the negative consequences of looking at bilinguals as if they had two distinct linguistic systems corresponding to the two named languages? I'm saying that is just not the case. But what is the consequence of what I propose is a mistake, okay? What are the consequences of that? And how is this dualistic thinking manifested in the education of bilingual students? What are the consequences on what can be done? And for that, I am going to turn the I recently heard this wonderful phrase in Spanish, le voy a dar el piso a Ophelia. <laughs> uh, um, okay, so. Gracias. Now, Gracias. let me see if Buenas. this machine is... <laughs> okay, I won't, I won't touch it because I'll mess it up. <laughs> But um, Ricardo also uh, expressed his gratitude to Anna and to Agustina uh, and to Espera de Jose, eh, Margarita, perdóname, Margarita. Uh, but I also wanted to acknowledge in the room uh, two very old friends, Professor Bob Bailey and Professor Cecilia Colombi. Cecilia reminds me that she invited us here in 1995. <laughs> <laughs> so we haven't been back. That was, that was probably before some of you were born. So. And Ophelia, that my, my book on Spanish pronouns in New York City was, was done because Bob Bailey said to me, I said, what do I study in the Spanish of New York? And he said, do subject pronouns. <laughs> it's his fault. <laughs> Um, I can't talk about children and they like today without remembering Valdez. I think it's in our minds mm -hmm. and in our minds also is uh, the teachers who have really uh, kept the society going. In New York City, things were closed. Things are still closed in the university, uh, but the teachers are there and the schools are there. And they're not only exposed to COVID, they're also getting shocked. So I, I just want to acknowledge that because I speak with a heavy heart when I think of schools and education today. But I want to start not with schools, but with faculty, because um, I thought that it would be interesting for us to think about Paco's reading of Jorge el Curioso. Um, Paco lives in a bilingual home, he's three years old, mother, second generation, father, a gringo who speaks Spanish. Um, he has books in both languages and he happens to have Curious George and Jorge Curioso, both in English and Spanish. And one day, uh, oh, and for this I need the uh, laptop so that I can get it going. One day he picks up 
the book in Spanish, Jorge el Curioso, and how do we get this going? Here I go. Okay, can we hear it? Let's see. Let's see if we can hear it. We didn't test it. One of you can tell me some of your impressions. Someone wants to go first. Yes. So I just uh, this is so I just talked about the meeting. He doesn't know how to read yet. Eric does have this ability, and then he just wanted to say some of those. Okay. So we thought it interesting how he would say the verb in Spanish, and then um, here is the story. Right. So then we have um, so we don't have to but that transition, or if you memorize it in English, it's just it's just so easy. Okay, all right, good. Someone else? Yes, yes. So, my partner doesn't really eat Spanish and she's completely lost and she didn't even recommend the word hat. Oh, <laughs> uh -huh. interesting, interesting. One more. Yes. We were just mentioning that it's completely seamless. It's completely seamless as the flow of both languages and, mm -hmm. and everything here. So, it's good. Okay. So I think what 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 I wanted to what we wanted to show with this is how a three year old is constructing his bilingual practices, right? Mm -hmm. And his reading, right? You're right. He doesn't yet know how to read, but he's reading this text, right, with all his resources, right? So uh, the problem is that when the preschool teacher hears this uh, tape, she says, "Oh." He uses words that really do not exist on the couple. Or, or he uses his own words, right? He uses balloons, hot and pack. And he's code switching all the time. He's using all these we do, we do, and whoops, and curious George with English phonology. And her conclusion is that Paco's language is full of interferences from English. Right, so that's her conclusion. Paco goes to first grade, and one day after Christmas, he writes this. Who wants to read it? 
Margarita, ¿me lo puedes leer? Gracias. Mi en Nochebuena, for a sleepover at abuela and abuelo's house. Right. <laughs> so, but the teacher, of course, is completely ignorant about what would be Nochebuena uh, and what abuelo and abuela, she knows, but Nochebuena, she doesn't understand. So, he, she concludes, well, he has a lot of words that he doesn't really know in English, right? And he mixes the two languages and she starts wondering these questions that we all have been taught to ask. What is his first language? Does it make sense for Paco? What's his first language? What's his second language? Does it make sense for Paco, right? Is Paco an English language learner? She starts wondering, maybe he's not a native speaker like I thought, maybe he is uh, an, an English language learner. So, Paco goes to third grade. The family has moved, thank God, and he is now in a dual language bilingual classroom where the mother and father thought they were going to solve this issue about the teachers being ignorant. So now that she ha he has bilingual teachers, he has two teachers, he's in a uh, side by side classroom, but of course, the dual language bilingual classroom have been also constructed by social linguistic concepts that have been given to us externally again without considering who the speakers are. So there is a complete diglossia, complete language separation between the languages, one day in Spanish, one day in English in his particular program. And the thinking is he is going to develop into a bilingual additively because he has a first language and we're going to add a second language. Remember that we have just said that he has no first language and no second language, right? Uh, so he has two teachers, two, two well-meaning teachers. Um, he has Miss Stewart as the English teacher, but Miss Stewart thinks that his English is efficient she puts him in the lowest reading level. Uh, she gives him a remedial curriculum, very phonics oriented, because she thinks that his problem is his Spanish, right? But then the next day she goes to La Señora Medina, and La Señora Medina, who uh, was Colombian, born and studied in Colombia, and then came, went to a university that I won't name, and he became a teacher, uh, also sees him as deficient. She thinks that he has interferences from English, and now she thinks that the problem is English, right? So in English or Spanish, the consequence is this child doesn't fit, right? This child failed. This child is, as the teachers once told me, nilingue, right? Without either one nor the other, right? Now, um, I want to just, because I want to make sure that we understand this classroom so that I can go on, I want to remind you that in this classroom, not only is, is there tackle, and that's probably my phone, one of my children probably calling me because they've been calling me all day because they're so upset about who I live. So, you know, they all have children and we're all upset, um, but I'll ignore it. Um, so, but Paco has other classmates. And the issue, of course, is that the children are looked at as being just English language learners or just being Spanish language learners instead of understanding that there is a whole continuum of bilingual practices in the classroom, right? There's Julia, Julia arrived from Honduras, she's Garifuna, uh, by the way, it means she's Black. Well, some people don't understand what a Garifuna community is. Teacher has no idea what a Garif what Garifuna is. She arrived just a year ago. There's Minerva. She actually, her parents are Dominican, but she was born in the US. There's Gladys. She has an African-American mother and a Mexican father. And there's Ina Abul, who's, who is the English person that everybody says he's monolingual. He doesn't speak Spanish, but he's not monolingual. He also speaks Dari and Pashto. So lots of complexity in this classroom that is not recognized. So, what are Ms. Stewart and Sela Senor Medina doing? Well, they, we were faced with COVID, and COVID has given us a lot of challenges, but it has also given us some opportunities. 
and there was a pause. And during this pause, some things started happening. Uh, the teachers, the two teachers started really collaborating, sharing their information of the students, because they didn't know what they were doing or what they were going to do. So they had to rely on each other much more than they did when they each had a classroom and they never talked about the kids jointly. She was able to see, they were able to see the family engagement. They were able to see the mother who spoke no English, Julia's mother who spoke no English, who actually was able to help Julia with the English homework through Spanish, right? So things started really questioning for them, right? Um, she was, they were able to see that the children had incredible independence and were able to really do things that they didn't know that they could actually do and identify some of their strengths. And they started thinking, well, how is it that their students are using their entire repertoire to make sense of the text? They had never asked themselves that question. They were doing things in English, things in Spanish, and they had never thought about what the students themselves were, de uh, were doing. And they started seeing differences that they had not um, detected before. For example, they started understanding that there was a difference between having a, a linguistic performance with specific linguistic features and just being good language user, having general a general language performance. For example, Julia was, you recall, as a child who came a year ago uh, from Honduras, um, uh, uh, Julia uh, knew about punta music, the Scarifuna music. She was able to do the drums. She and the teachers actually had no idea that she was such a talented musician, able to really compose lyrics. And they started seeing Julia also how she interacted with her peers to find out how to do it, uh, an assignment that uh, she didn't know how to do, how she looked at Google Translate, how she found things, how she was able to find text-based evidence, all these things that they were being asked to do, Julia could do, even though she couldn't do it in English, right? And this was the first time that the teachers understood that there was much more to Julia than just being an English language learner. So they learned a little bit about translanguaging. They started to hear about it. And again, they do, as Ricardo said, they learned that um, bilinguals really do not have two autonomous ent entities corresponding to name languages, but they do language with a unitary repertoire. This is a very big difference, right? Between thinking that a person has a language to thinking about how you do language. That's what the languaging, the ing in translanguaging is important. And that this repertoire is just not compartmentalized into two boxes. And then they started asking the question that I think all teachers ask of themselves. How is it that we can really leverage this unitary repertoire, especially in a dual language bilingual school that has a policy of one day in English and one day in Spanish, and that we're not going to change, and perhaps we shouldn't change. I mean, I think we do need spaces in which we hear the language, language into comprehensible input. It's still important, right? But how do we then make spaces uh, for translanguaging? And this was some of the work that we did uh, with two college, col colleagues, Susanne Iberti-Vata Johnson and Kate Seltzer. Um, and one of the things that uh, Ms. Stewart and La Señora Medina started doing is questioning their beliefs. What was it that they thought about their students, about language, about bilingualism, about teaching bilingual, bilingually, and about bilingual and biliteracy development? And what's it that they start questioning about all those beliefs, right? That is what we call, these are the components of a translanguaging pedagogy, right? And what, that's what we call the translanguaging stance. Because if you don't have a stance on this, you're never going to be able to do it. Because it's hard to do. It's much easier to say, oh, I'm just going to do it in English and ignore the rest of what the child asks, right? Um, or, and then they started thinking, well, how do we design these spaces within the space that is allotted to English and the space allotted to Spanish? How do we design this, an instructional space that is really going to get 
to leverage the child's image-average repertoire? And how do we follow the student's strengths? And I think this is important because one of the things that the force for COVID taught us is that it is very important to have these breathing spaces in which we follow the student's strength instead of thinking that we, we direct the current our way. So these are the shifts. So let me first start with the translanguaging stance. We call it the junto stance, right? Uh, and we call it the junto stance because we want to make sure that everybody understands that this, of course, is unitary and that we have to have these, uh, this belief, this deep belief that the students are not categories, they're just not English language learners and Spanish language learners. So there's a bilingual continuum. And every task that you give a student, you are placed differently on that continuum, right? Some, st some students do very well when they speak and they do terribly when they write. And it doesn't, so there's this continuum depending on the task. Uh, and that they do have a very rich repertoire. And the idea is this, Ricardo said, and I'm gonna repeat it again, right? That the repertoire of a bilingual child is just richer, it's more extended than that of a monolingual child, right? But we don't recognize it because we keep looking at them as if they are two monolinguals. Um, it, as far as language, they started thinking about language not as something that they had, but as something that they did. As far as bilingualism, they started understanding that bilingualism is not simply additive, but it is dynamic. It's not two boxes, right? But it is the interaction the way we, in which we put it all together, that is important. And as far as language teaching is concerned, they started understanding that what they were doing was not simply adding another box. Because if you think that what you do when you read, uh, teach a language is you add a box, you forget about the first box. You forget about the, what the child already has, right? But um, I like the image of pearls in a string, right? So what you're doing when you are teaching a language, a language, is you're adding these pearls to the string, to this repertoire, right? And by which the, the students can really adorn themselves, but you're extending the repertoire, but you're not simply adding a box. Uh, so just an example, because I see that there are, I thought that we were going to have more teachers, Margarita, but just a, a quick example, one of the things that they do is uh, during the reading workshop, which is something that is done in most classrooms in the United States today, they still follow the language of the day. So the day that they have, they do English, they did it in English, the day that they do Spanish, they do it in Spanish, but they opened up a translanguaging space. How did they do that? For example, during the read aloud, they always allow the students to ask questions and to engage in dialogue in whatever, uh, with whatever resources they have. Sometimes Julia could say it in Spanish and someone else translated it. Sometimes she would draw it. Sometimes she would act it out. But the idea was that you don't have to, just because you are teaching in the language of the day and just because the text that you're reading are in English or Spanish in the language of the day does not mean that you do not allow the students to make sense of what they're hearing with all the resources that they have. So they allow this. And then why is it that they allow it? They allow it because they know that it's a good way of scaffolding the instruction so that everybody understands. If you teach, you know that if your students do not understand, you're not educated. So I don't understand how we continue to teach students and not have them make sense of what it is that we're teaching. So do doing as a scaffold and also to document and assess what a child knows, right? You cannot get to what Julia knows unless you allow her to use her full repertoire. So that's as far as the, the read aloud. The, the, the other example is a guided reading, which again, we do a lot in, in, in classrooms, in primary classrooms these days. And during that time, the text that they read was in the language of the day. So they read in English or they read in Spanish, in the language of the day. But um, what they do during this uh, uh, translanguaging space 
is she would have then groups of students who would then discuss the text with whatever resources they had and they helped each other so that there would be peer collaboration and that's the way that they made sense of the text. Why? Because we know that really all of us who are bilingual in this room, there are many of us, know that we may read in a language, but we don't read in that language. We read all ourselves in the text. We bring ourselves into the text, right? Always. And so we do the same in the classroom. The text might be in English, but there are no monolingual texts if the reader is, is bilingual and is making sense of the text because the text has to speak back to you, right? And there is that dynamic that makes meaning for the text. And the other thing is that it allows the students to transform these subjectivities, these subjectivities of deficiencies that we create, we produce the deficiencies by saying that they don't have this or that, but by allowing them to use all that they have you then transform these subjectivities into more positive subjectivities. Um, and finally, the shifts, right? One of the things that happens is they stop asking the stupid question of what is it that Julia doesn't have, right? What is it that Julia cannot do? They start seeing Julia differently. In this case, we're, we're looking at Paco again. So they start asking questions like, how is he engaged? What's his position when he reads a book? Is he engaged? Is he not engaged? What are his gestures? What is he feeling? What, is it, what are his emotions? What are his interests? How is he making connections with other things that we taught and with others in the room? Questions are completely different from what is it that he doesn't have. And then there are even further questions that are, what are how, do, how does he get to the key ideas? How does he infer how does he is he capable of complex thought can he associate ideas from multiple texts is he able to argue and persuade effectively so a completely different questioning about the child as a learner from thinking that the language that the child does not have and therefore those are the only questions that you ask about the child so um just want to say uh, sort of to to close is that uh, so we can have a little discussion is that um, these translanguaging pedagogical practices that we have been developing are not simply strategies, but they're ways of opening up a translanguaging space for strategic reasons. And people always ask me, how much is translanguaging? I say, if you're not doing it for one of these, one of these four reasons, it's probably too much, right? <laughs> to scaffold, to document or assess what the child knows, to deepen understandings, and to transform subjectivities. That is a work that we have done uh, in the CUNY NICEF project. We just published, Ricardo was the principal investigator of the project. We just published a, a book, Together Juntos, right? Because we've done it together. This is a, a, a big collaboration. And I, I want you know, I tell you there how difficult it is because of course schools come tumbling down if you don't push all the time, but we, we try to do it. And the, the work has expanded. Um, I, I think, I don't know if you're interested, there's a website, we have lots of resources. It's been a, a real labor of love among many of us and um, lots of resources, lots of videos, et cetera. And that's part of the resources and we have the translanguage in classrooms and then the work goes So Cecilia Espinosa and Laura Lenz and Sensi Moreno published Rooted in Strength, which is again, about literacy, translanguaging and literacy, and Carla España and Luz Herrera published in Comunidad, which is about children's literature, Latino children's literature that we need in the classroom, right? So that you can have temas that are interesting to them, they can have textos that are interesting to them, and we can then do translanguaging. Those are the three T's that we talked about, temas, textos, and translanguaging. <clears throat> Mike Mena, if you don't know him, he has incredible, he's a linguistic anthropologist, a student of ours, <clears throat> incredible web, web um, YouTubes, I guess, um, and you can look him up, Mike Mena, look up his language and you'll find a hundred things, that, and that's uh, our latest book, it's called uh, Transforming Translanguaging Espacios 
seem miedo, right? Because the problem is that we're all afraid to go against the current. Ricardo, that's the Nina to <laughs> To conclude, I gotta be, I'm, at, I'm attached to this machine here. So, uh, to conclude, we have been saying that bilingualism does not exist from the psycholinguistic point of view, just as races do not exist from the biological point of view. Now, it would be foolhardy to simply say races don't exist, even because we know that race is not a biological concept, okay? But even though it is not a biological concept, it exists as a very important social invention. In the same way, bilingualism exists as a, an important and valuable to the individual social invention. We're trying to uh, remind ourselves that there is very little reason to believe that it exists as a cognitive duality. Um, the name language, like the name race, is a social invention. Remember, lexical and structural traits exist, of course, and biological traits exist but the language and the race do not exist except as social inventions and as means to exert power and control and subjugate racialized groups. So we're trying to make a big distinction between the social realm, the social ontology and the biological, in this case, mental ontology. The last bullet there talks about the importance of bilingualism and bilingual education. None of what we've said is to diminish the importance of the work that bilingual teachers do or that teachers do in general, especially in the present uh, uh, circumstances, because we, because we live in a society and we work and live and swim in the waters of social inventions. So that's what makes that, that uh, work important because it is important to the child. We're talking about the conception of it that one has. Um, when thinking about the individual. And the last two questions, what does the invention of the language accomplish? It articulates and makes possible the concept of language contact and linguistic stigmatization. And it makes possible the concept of additive bilingualism and educational failure. Who benefits from the invention of language? Who advances their political and social positioning by creating languages that articulate the notion of contact in linguistics and the notion of additive separate bilingualism in education and bilinguals. And we leave you with these questions for you to meditate on who benefits from saying that Altagracia doesn't have a complete language um, and that she has a divergent acquisition. Who is, who is to gain from all this? So we leave you with these questions and we say to you, gracias. <laughs> Muchísimas gracias to our plenaries, Dr. Ophelia Garcia and Dr. Ricardo Otegui. Um, so now we have about 20 minutes uh, for the question and answer session. Of course, you all are welcome to continue discussing after that as well. Um, but we'll open it up to questions both here in person and then we also have many attendees on Zoom. Um, and Bev is moderating the Zoom, so please let us know if you have any questions from there. But first, does anyone in the audience have a question? Well, the, if for me, the biggest problem of the term heritage speaker, and I recognize its contributions and its positive value and what many scholars who work with the term have accomplished, not denying any of that, but I think that the term heritage speaker enables the possibility of thinking of these speakers as not natives because it allows the possibility in the mind of people who are thinking about this, well, they're native speakers and they are the monolingual ones. So the monolingual becomes 
the actual only legitimate speaker. And then there are heritage speakers, which are now something else. And once you allow the idea that the heritage speaker is something else, now you can go down the road of saying that they're, this language that they acquired in, in, at the time when all human beings assemble a grammar in their minds, that this is incomplete or is divergent or it's something else. So to me, the problem with the term heritage speaker is that it allows this confusion that the heritage speakers are not natives. Even if you say, oh, no, no, I know, I know, I know the native speakers. Well, if the native speakers, let's call them that. Then comes your question. Well, if we call them native speakers, and by the way, when I was young, there was, I remember when we had classes of Spanish for, for native speakers, this was even a thing, SNS, you know, so as, as many of you know. So uh, why we switched over to heritage speaker, I'm not entirely clear. I think if we need a term, we can say Spanish for bilingual speakers. You know, we can say, we can call them bilingual if that is if that is a useful term. What we need is a term that does not deny the simple fact that they have grown up in the situation that all over the world induces a grammar that is complete and finished and many times many different from that of the parents in all, all over the world. Now the trouble is, of course, that the term heritage speaker now has become extended. I hear to people who only had one parent, maybe a father, you know? So you have a, a, an African-American um, African American mother married to a Puerto Rican in New York. This happens a lot. Well, and that's a heritage speaker. Well, but he didn't have a Spanish speaking mother. And so if we call that person a heritage speaker, now the term becomes itself a, a cause of confusion. So I think terms should be used to help us think and to clarify things. And I think the term heritage speaker is not always helpful because of this suggestion that these are not native speakers. Because no linguist would ever travel to do anthropological linguistic research to some place in the Amazon and find people who grew up and say, oh, they have an incomplete language. No, we, we always say whatever the language is, is the language that that person has. So. I don't know what the term would be, maybe bilingual, maybe go back to native speaker. No, yeah. And if I may add, I also don't like the term heritage speaker because it's also looking at the past. Ah, the interesting. It's actually something you say. Interesting. You have your past. Of course. It's not like the West said, you acquire the language by saying bye. Interesting. There is there is that. I don't like it either, but we have bilingual, and then there was a problem with bilingual before because I think it was the same thing you were saying. It was uh, differentiating between native speakers and bilingual speakers. So bilingual speakers tend to be two learners with their English. So that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I know you are you monitoring this or what we so I think hearing the term multilingual speaker to refer to what we used to say were bilingual speakers. So several of the of the they're called network improvement communities. So they're teachers of what we would call bilingual speakers are using the term multilingual. Yeah. To refer to two languages, even though it's only two languages. So is that something you come across? Have you have thoughts on on that? And and it's I mean the explanation that I brought is that it's not addressing multiple languages in one speaker, it's addressing the multiple Look, I, I, mean, I, I, yeah. I know because I have the same problem. New York has, is now calling everybody multilingual learner. Okay. But, you know, it's very easy to have a multilingual learner because we live in a multilingual society where everybody is a multilingual learner. So, con eso se limpian el pecho, ya no hacen más nada. You know, they, they don't have to do anything else. Um, so that's, that's one of my problems with multilingual learners. Um, and a lot of people have told me, give up the bilingual. <laughs> but you know what? I have a history, right? It's a history of struggle. It comes from civil civil rights era on. It's a community struggle. So I'm not giving the term bilingual because of what it means historically to me. You may you may it may not mean anything to you, and you can you could uh, not use it. But I need to 
uh, link my my thinking and my history to what happened before and the, to the community struggles also. If I don't do that, I think I'm I'm not, you know, I'm not recognizing the, the struggles. And and you know, Margarita, that the silencing of the word bilingual has has been, yeah. you know, with dual language. I mean, I insist on calling them dual language bilingual programs, but people say dual language. Dual language has substituted the word bilingual, and it's been a silencing of bilingualism in, since No Child Left Behind, uh, completely in the legislation, in, the, in our discourse, it, the word has disappeared. That's why I started naming them emergent bilinguals, because everybody said English language learners. Uh, English language learners silenced the bilingualism. So, um, so that's that's my that's my issue with holding on to bilingualism, which is true. Maybe people are right. I, we should give it up, but I can't do it because of what it means to me. So, mm -hmm. someone there. Yeah. So, I mean, almost everything you're saying, I think, is really great. I love it, but I have a strong a strong opinion you can't neatly separate the cognitive from the social, especially when it comes to language. So much about our language use, it's been prescribed what language you're, you're using, what we're comfortable with, what our repertoire is, is so strongly driven by by social. And, and the social so much connects to our, to our emotions and uh, you know, getting into identities, getting into our ideologies, all of this is completely entwined with, with cognition and what our, what our repertoires are. So I, I just I, I just cannot um, I cannot uh, embrace the theory that separates cognition from social emotion. Just can't be separated. Not so much. Uh, okay, wait, about it. It's kind of it's very central to separate cognition from social. I just can't can't make that move. Go ahead. Because <laughs> I agree a little bit with her. <laughs> well, and 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 so do I. I, the reason I think that that distinction so overdrawn, perhaps, is, is useful is because we want to stress the findings and the, the instructions that we've gotten from, for example, anthropologists like Suzanne Romain, who tell me that the notion of a language is very, in her terms, very likely a Western creation, okay? <laughs> that the instruction that I get from, uh, from the African linguists, such as Sinfri Maconi, who tell us that in many parts of the world, the <laughs> idea that speakers are separated into neatly categorized languages is foreign. So what I am trying to assimilate into my thinking is the idea that the way we think about languages, we think about languages as very neat and clear cut categories, Arabic, Spanish, French, English, that this categorization is, is a cultural fact, not universal. And that, however, we have imputed to the mind. In other words, we have taken this neat categorization of, of the features that a person owns as, as um, social categorizations. If these languages are social inventions, if these labels are social inventions and are a Western, a peculiarly Western way to look at languaging, then we should not be so freely making the assumption that people who are bilingual have two of these. You see, that's, that's what my problem is. Yeah, especially since you know uh, social knowledge is a form of cognition, of course. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, the reason I I, I want to make it is because I when people say to me, "What is it that if if you have a a view of ling of of linguistics as as I do that there that the, 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 there is in the mind." something that enables speech. And if that something is words and morphemes and rules and whatever your linguistic theory provides, that's a contested territory that I'm not interested in now. If you have that idea, then I want to use the term cognitive to refer to the fact that I have these things in me and that we all have these things in us, these phonemes, these words, these rules. 
Um, and I'm using cognitive for that. And that the, bi the person that we call bilingual has a whole string of these things. And that the dividing them up into two is the product of, of society. Now, there, I think you're right that then we, we fall into the perhaps the overstatement, but I'm, that's what I'm trying to accomplish. And I, there, there, there has to be a better way is what you're telling me. And I, I appreciate that. You know, we have, uh, because I, I have the same problem you have sometimes, you know, we, we present jointly, but you know, we have differences, which is, I think it's, it's important to recognize. Um, and I, it's something that I'm much more comfortable with is the external perspective and the internal perspective. I think that 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 I that I buy <laughs> much more than the. Influence when we when other people are thinking around us, we, we, we yeah. internalize the external. We're just constantly doing it. It's a, it's a struggle, right? But it exists and happens. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. First of all, thank you so much. This is really interesting. Um, so I, I had a question about, so I'm, um, I'm a graduate student psychology, so I study psycholinguistics, and I, you know, I've been really interested in studying what we call writing character, you know, character studies, what we were talking about, but, you know, when I grew up, um, this all just came to me, because when I grew up, I grew up in a very, like, mixed kind of, like, dual language household, where I only spoke Spanish to my mom, and she was like, you don't say a word of English to me, <laughs> but I didn't speak Spanish at all with my dad, because he was in Spanish. Um, and that kind of led me to want to study, you know, language in grad school. But in many ways, I feel like psycholinguistics, um, and I, you know, I don't know how people in this room are psycholinguists, so this might be good at saying this. But I feel like um, in many ways, it's limited, you know, and the methods that I use and the things I do, it's like, I feel frustrated in a way because I don't feel like I can get the full picture, like the whole story. And I'm very interested in cognition and very interested in those things, but I don't know, there's like something missing. I wanted to see if you have any advice or like, Anything for like psycholinguists on what to do moving <laughs> forward on how to incorporate these things in your research where you can get that full picture because I'm like stuck and I, I want to be able to do that. But I don't realize it's a, a, this is a tough question, but I'm very keen. <laughs> First of all, I, I think that you, your description of your household may in fact be over-reliant on the named languages and these categories. I, I doubt very much if the thing that we call Spanish and the thing that we call English, if the names that we give to these features mapped onto your conversations with your mother and your father as neatly as you are as you're telling us. I suspect that the situation was a lot more, a lot, a lot more fluid. But uh, psycholinguists, I think, have made a great contribution because they have, um, I, I find, for example, the, the, uh, the concurrent activation research to be very revealing in that they, in the failure to come up with very clear cut divisions between the, um, the languages, the fact that all the priming research that I am aware of, I'm not a psycholinguist, but I consume the research externally. The fact that the priming research appears to show that, uh, that there is so much cross-linguistic priming. Well, if there is cross-linguistic priming, that, I, that's an interpretation that begins with the assumption that there are two cognitively valid languages and that, there's, that they're priming across. It, the way I interpret this cross-linguistic priming research is to say that the representation is not dual. And that's why it's so easy for it to be this kind of priming where, you know, the, uh, the work knife and the work cuchillo do the exact same kind of priming, uh, <clears throat> despite the fact that they thought that they belong to two different cognitive compartments. So I think that their contribution has been extremely uh, valuable to me insofar in the little that I know about that research. But, uh, but so, no, but I wanted to say that you're absolutely right that it's unfortunate that we are always in camps and we consume the literature uh, of this camp and not of this one. And you're all young people. And I think there is now more interest in interdisciplinarity than there was before. And I think um, studies, uh, cultural studies have also helped with that. And I think the more that you as young people you, you can be a psycholinguist, but make sure that you know this sociolinguistic literature. I think that that would really help. So, I mean, there's no reason, I know that you're doing a doctor a dissertation with, with 
a psycholinguistic committee, but there is no reason why you have to stay there. <laughs> well, and I, and I think that the, the psycholinguists are very uh, successfully many times designing experiments. So what you're asking is how can I des design my experiments in such a way that they are less distant from the reality that you know? And that's a very good question. And that's the way I would phrase it. Now, I, I do not have the training to, to even begin to tell you how to do it, but that's what you have to do. The experiment is always going to be separated from the reality. The, the, in many ways, the sociolinguist who gathers materials and interviews people gets a little closer to the reality. It's not the reality either. I, I once did 140 interviews of people in New York to study pronouns, and I gather 40,000 examples. That's not the way people talk yet. In other words, you get closer, but there, there is still a... a um, a way that you need to do experiments to do psycholinguistics. The question is, how do you do the experiments so that your experience is, is reflected in them? That's the way I think you should pose the question. I have no idea how to answer it. I don't have that kind of, I don't have that kind of training. I don't know. Yes. I have a question from the I think that because, um, first of all, I never go into a school and um, not look first at what the policy is and then try to create the spaces within the policy. You cannot change a policy, right? So you have to think of where are the cracks, right? And, and in each school is different, right? Uh, but I do think that the schools that I have worked closely with and that I continue my work with um, have changed uh, after the pandemic, because the teachers realize um, that they, there's something else going on, they have to let go, they're more relaxed or more, or more uh, anxious, but more relaxed about following a curriculum. The pacing calendar, which drove them crazy, is gone. Uh, you know, so that's, I think that there has been space to, to uh, reconceptualize some practices. Um, you know, for example, I was in a school the other day, completely dual language, but uh, they have brought back the centers. Remember the centers? No, you probably don't remember them, but you know, they used to, they, we used to have centers in classrooms, right? Where the students went from center to center. Well, well they, when they came back, because they were doing, first of all, in New York City, they in this particular school, one third of the kids were in one day, one third the next day, and then the other third was on Zoom. I mean, it was it was crazy. So first of all, they had more time to look at what the children were doing, and they learned a lot. And they have not gone back to their old practices. They have really um, um, just just imagined what it could be without that structured curriculum. How long it'll last, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, so I think the field is, and you definitely outlined how it's helped to combat these racialistic ideologies in your classroom. How we can, uh, how we can start combating some of these ideologies outside of the classroom and the policing of language in the community where there's this new phenomenon of like a Yomo Saro kid and how um, heritage speakers are viewed as deficient because of their approxim approximation to white. So it's kind of like the opposite of what's going on in academic studies. So I'm wondering if you've given that. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about more about what the opposite of what's going on in yeah, academic? Yeah, so there's this like, discourse of the Yomo Saro kid where they're following the correct paradigm of regular verbs, but with the verb saber, they say something like, you know, 
So this is the title that they've given here to speakers within the Spanish speaking community. So I'll put it up. I didn't know um, that. Yeah, it's all over social media uh -huh. um, where, where people from the community are saying that heritage speakers don't speak Spanish because of their approximation to whiteness and to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you've given policing in the community some thought. Policing, like language policing in the community. Language policing in the community. Um, do you mean by that uh, people in the community that actually tell the kids you're you're speaking wrong? Is that... Spanish, yeah, bilingües. Porque dicen yo no sabo. And are you asking me whether I've seen that? Yeah, yeah. Whether... Have you given thought about how we can? Have uh, we started conducting this in academic settings, but how we can use this to expand the network? Yeah. Also? Well, you know, I think that we have to work with the parents. I mean, in in this school that I'm telling you about, um, part of what happened when we started thinking that uh, when we started opening up these trans languaging spaces is this is a smart principle, but she had a, a, a parents. Uh, came in on every Friday morning uh, before COVID. Uh, but even now it's back. And uh, so one of the things we did was we did a lot of workshops around with the parents around their own practices. You know, we didn't call it translanguaging, but so that they would understand that's what we were doing with the in these spaces, in these inquiry spaces, that they were creating these, these spaces. Um, but you're right. I mean, the um, the racial linguistic ideologies that you're talking about, Nelson Flores was my student, so I can tell you about this, um, is, um, uh, you know, we, we always say it's just not white, it's the, the people who have institutional power, right? Uh, and there, we, know, we know that there's a lot of racial linguistic ideologies within the Latino community, right? Uh, and so there's a lot of work to be done outside. The media has to do the work, um, uh, you know, but I, I think uh, I think if you start in the schools, I think it generates something because the kids have started to understand a lot of things that they didn't. This critical consciousness that we talk about, um, I think that is that is that bubbles up to to the families. But I don't know if any instances. Maybe you do. Maybe all of you do. Well, I mean, I. I I think the first step is to try to understand what, what it is. This is an old problem. I mean, this is the old problem of denigrating the speech of, of people that we call bilingual because of presumed resemblances to the, to the other language. There is an English speaker who, who we call monolingual who always says, I could have went, okay? I could have went is the way that person learned to speak that's his English, and the that's what you need to to hammer on. This is this person's English. He says, "I could have went." Maybe if he goes to school and begins to have different connections, someday he may add to that repertoire the phrase, "I could have gone." But "I could have went" is perfectly normal and acceptable. Yo no sabo is totally disconnected from English. It has, in fact, nothing to do with English. And children all over Latin America and Europe say yo no sabo. All our children say yo no sabo until they gave it up. So the, the, the first thing for you to know is that this doesn't make any sense. And that this is simply another iteration of the idea that, that, that some grammars are legitimate and some grammars are not. And that therefore the production that we hear from those grammars is to be denigrated. If you get that clear, then this notion that these people are being criticized in the community, okay, they're being criticized by some parts of, I mean, I don't know, because I don't live on the internet, but they're being <laughs> criticized by some part of the community that apparently is very likely first generation and has very little experience with raising children because Jorno Savo is a very strange way to name something that is going to be connected with English. What on earth is their connection between Jorno Savo and English? Uh, so um, I, now as far as what to do and how to get these ideas that, that, we, that we try to develop in the academy and get them out there, 
But, mm-hmm. but I, I, I want to say that it's, you know, it gets more and more complicated, right? I mean, when, when we started working with bilingual education, the parents would say things like, I want my kids to do it all in English, right? So that's one level of, of linguistic prejudice that they have about their own practices, right? And then it's, I want my, my child to speak standard Spanish. I don't want him speaking Sibaino. Right, we have lots of Dominicans. Sibaño, no, no good. Caribbean Spanish, no good. Uh, and 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 then you know, I don't want him speaking Spanglish. You know, the translanguaging spaces. Oh, is that about Spanglish? Because I don't want him speaking Spanglish. Uh, and it's all the um, all these subjectivities of inferiority that have been uh, developed in all of us. And it's hard. It's hard to. And it, you also have to understand where the parents are at. Right. Uh, the, all these parents want the same for the kids that we all want for our kids, right? Uh, so you have to make sure that they understand that what you're doing also extends the repertoire, right? Uh, because that's that I think is what every parent wants uh, without giving themselves, giving up themselves and giving up and, and, and um, giving up this subjectivity of inferiority, which I think many, many bilinguals have, bilingual communities have about their language, about themselves, which is part of the history, right? Can't deny it. One thing that I tell people, and I, I sometimes cannot always be very nice, is that this idea that language of a certain kind or a certain language is a gateway to economic progress, and that's why the parents want this, I tell them, yes, tell that to the African-Americans who have been speaking in English for the past 17 generations, uh, that that language is the way to, to equality and to pro- prosperity. So um, many of them speaking a, a completely unrec- a, a form of English that is exactly the same as everybody else's. And that still, it, it's not, the idea that language will make it for you is a very, an idea that is very hard to to uh, let go of, and so I can see that interacting with the parents and with the people in the community will be will be hard. But it'd be good for you to make to understand whether what they're saying makes sense before you even try to to work on it. You know. Maybe one more question before we open up. Uh, so you had a discussion question earlier, and I had like a wiggly thought about it, and then Ophelia said something, and then it like solidified a bit, <laughs> but. Uh, so there was a discussion question about like who benefits from the notion of like named languages, um, and then you mentioned that you have this like relationship with the term bilingualism. I was wondering about like for people or like communities that have like similar relationships with a named language on like a person or community level because of some sort of like well, what's has historically oppressed or taken away? Like would that like right. make it worth it like, to, right. like a notion of the yeah yeah well i think that's where this the the difference in the social i think is, is important because i think ricardo said that um for me spanish is important right bilingualism is important i want my grandchildren to be bilingual right um so yes you're absolutely right indigenous communities that have are in the process of either revitalizing or awakening the languages um often say well you know we have to name it but you know i think what they have what we all have to understand is what they what you don't want to get into is the idea that there is a norm by which you're judged and then everybody else who does not meet the norm of that named language that has been constructed then is a poor speaker of that language because we'll never get to awaken the language or revitalize the languages if we are not inclusive about our practices, right? So again, that's why to me, the, the, the pearls in the string makes sense, right? Because it's about adding, right? About completely adding. Uh, but of course, I think that you're right. I think that the, um, the idea of a named language for the Miami indigenous community, for example, that is important. It's important to name it. But the question is, how do you teach it? And what what norms do you expect them to have, right? Uh, 
So that's that's yeah. Yeah. So the the idea that the, that that a name language can be a, a source of aesthetic pleasure or a source of affective connection, identity. source of identity, all of that makes uh, perfect sense. And I think it, it can be very uh, beneficial. The trouble comes when we begin to think of that, of that name and of that very vague nebulous social concept called Korean, as if it were a hard thing implanted in the mind of a Korean. And then it turns out that it is not that, and and that um, and that all that Korean person has is a bunch of words and a bunch of phonemes and a bunch of rules or whatever, and and so we, we need to keep a distinction between those social concepts which legitimately produce a great deal of aesthetic and pleasure and identity from the confusion that gets created when one thinks that those things exist in a way that is either that an utterance either belongs to it or doesn't belong to it. So that Yo Sabo, in the case that we were talking about, is ruled out as non, not belonging to that beautiful thing that we call Spanish and identify with. Well, I could have went and Yo Sabo are, they, they belong to that speaker's thing, okay? It, it allows others to have power over that person if we can now say that's not English and that's not Spanish. So um, and it's important to know that these sources of identity and these sources of aesthetic pleasure are a, a um, un arma de doble filo. They really are a, a, a double-edged sword because they can in fact be used very and have been used constantly for you know denigratory purposes. So that's... So here's another wiggly thought. <laughs> um, um, who is, you would know, Bob, uh, who is the Creolist who does, um, who did the Haitian Creole work? And always said, Haitian Creole is not a Creole, it's a language. De Graff, and, Michel huh? de Graff. Michel de Graff, right. Yeah. And, you know, what I would like him, uh, all of us to understand is that all languages are, you know, we should go back, we should, we should go the other way. Not, not everything has to be a language because if you're doing it this way, then socially, yes, it's, it's recognized, but then what happens is again, you're leaving people behind, right? But how do we change the direction so that it goes the other way? So that, I don't know, all named languages are Creoles or, you know, what, how, do we, how do we do it to include the practices of the many who are developing their, bilingualism and there's a big danger i think and this is one that I, which is when when ophelia puts it this way i'm always afraid that that she may be misunderstood or if i said it i would be misunderstood That's that right. we, you can say i'm misunderstood <laughs> that we do it this way because we want to be good to people okay i think there is a big danger that this is a matter of of political preference and that people who are pc and and liberal minded academics want to think this way. I, I want to say no. I want to say that the kinds of things that Ophelia just said are valuable not because they're good to people but because they make sense and that if one thinks about language differently I'm afraid to say one is wrong and I think I, I want to make sure that we distinguish between the things that we do because we are good people and the things that we do because we are reasonable people. And that's that's to me that's an important distinction to make. Otherwise, everything can be can be dismissed as well. For you know, for a good guy like you, maybe that's the way to think about it. But I'm a I'm a hard nosed, tough minded person, and therefore I think that Spanish is Spanish, English is English, and that's all there is to it. No, that kind of thinking is not tough. It's just wrong. <laughs> so let's. So there has been a debate about like the living like um a variety, like naming the variety of Spanish in the USA is like its own variety, right? In contrast to the concept of like naming something and having the power. Because in the end, like working on a Washington, like to feel like we have the world that every bilingual is gonna be uh you know in place and test at the university in a standardized test, they're gonna be uh, assessed to be monolingual. It's like, 
can we name them like differently? Can we have like a different name for trans lady and lady? Because it's, it's a bilingual variety with different features that, uh, that they display. So I don't know if that would be a solution, uh, but it has to do with the possible conception of like name subjects and how they display. So I don't know. I, I didn't hear everything. I only heard about assessment. I'm sorry. But I'll tell you because I think assessment is yeah. crucial. Assessment is at the root of all of this, right? First of all, remember the testing industry is yes. wealthy, right? Real wealthy. Um, and so, and, and the traditions, you know, the traditions of thought that you were talking about, the fact that we study things this way, the psychometricians still, they're hung up on, on reliability <laughs> not a validity I'm, I can you know but where is the consequential validity of what it is that they're doing right um so uh it's very very hard to change the testing industry uh, and you're absolutely right that those numbers mean nothing you have to make sure that the teachers know that the numbers that they assign the children meet mean nothing uh, could there be a testing industry that assesses with a translanguaging lens so that they, they could um, assess the whole unitary repertoire. Yes, we have the technology to do it. It's too expensive and no one is going to do it yet. ETS is taking baby steps. They have now developed, for example, math tests in which uh, the children could answer in English or Spanish or either in written or orally, because if you're gonna test math, you don't have to test it with language. Um, formative assessments in the classroom, teacher assessments, there's no reason why a teacher cannot assess uh, making sure not English and Spanish, but together, right? So that we, so that the children uh, are assessed on how they use language. Um, so on the teachers, yes, on the testing industry slowly, but maybe you'll see it because the technology is there to do it. We just need to liberate ourselves from some concepts. I don't know, I didn't hear the rest of the question. Maybe you did. No, I mean, I, I, if, if you are comfortable with the notion of varieties and dialects and so forth, uh, then, then you've named it. You've said Spanish in the US, but of course Spanish in the US is again, such a vague notion that, and all these names of varieties are, you know, I mean, they, they're suspiciously map onto national categories. So you have Argentinian Spanish and Cuban Spanish, and, and it's a little bit hard, it's hard for me to believe that one would have come up with those categories inductively if we didn't have Argentina and Cuba mm -hmm. beforehand. I think we, I think these varieties, and imagine if we tried to say that there's something called U.S. Spanish. Well, there are many features that many speakers of Spanish share, but they mostly share features with everybody else. So, however, if your audience needs the notion of a variety and you want to say U.S. Spanish, then maybe that, maybe that, maybe that. Maybe that <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. Such a beautiful place to leave our discussion. Another round of applause. <laughs>
uh, glad to have been able to host this event hybridly and have hosted presenters, attendees, questions and discussions from all over the world. Uh, thanks to the technology working mostly fine. So we're very, we're very <laughs> glad about that, that side. Um, second of all, obviously connections among the, the themes and the discussion, both the research, the methodology, uh, the fact that we able um, to add this pre-conference uh, uh, workshop that we hosted uh, yesterday, uh, focusing especially on, on corpus, language corpus research with our amazing uh, keynote speaker from West Virginia University, Dr. Tracy, uh, Tracy Ventura, um, and, and making those connections with um, uh, different ways to expand our research, especially uh, you know, with, with the, the amazing uh, conversations about how to uh, create those corpora, how to engage with speakers from varied uh, uh, situations and scenarios and study abroad specifically. I'm sure you'll be able to find a lot of RAs and research system that will uh, help you with that study abroad research uh, in the room. Um, and obviously among uh, connections among our, our presenters, we're already starting to, uh, to see some, some of those presentations that try to challenge those social and those limiting notions and try to take the research beyond uh, into future directions. So uh, lastly, just connections, hopefully with the next symposium, next year's ninth annual symposium that we'll ho hopefully host um, here next year, where we'll hopefully see a lot more of those conversations that we're starting to see appear within, within our interdisciplinary fields that we're, we're so proud to, to be a part of. Um, Lastly, just uh, a few uh, words of, of thank you, um, obviously to to all of our of our keynotes. Another round of applause for Dr. Tracy. <laughs> Video, which we already mentioned. Thank you so much to all of our uh, volunteer uh, moderators who helped us with our panel and to our, our committee members. Um, and we cannot uh, leave without thanking our uh, sponsors. <laughs> we have the, the list. Uh, yes, we have the um, long list of sponsors. Actually, yes. we're so thankful for the support <laughs> of our sponsors. We'd like to thank the GSA, the Graduate Student Association, um, the Graduate and Professional School RSO Event Grant, um, Professor Zalu and Professor Warwick, the Spanish and Portuguese department, the Beyond Tolerance grants, the Pepsi product grant. We <laughs> 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 have a lot of pictures with the Pepsi. Um, <laughs> the Davis um, Language Center, Department of French and Italian, Department of German and Russian, and the Department of East and Asian Languages and Cultures. So thank you so much to all of our sponsors this day. <laughs> Without further ado, um, you know, I just want to say that it's been such a pleasure to be one of the co-chairs for the language cluster to help organize the symposium. Um, but it's, I think it's time now to announce next year's co-chairs who are going to go off and do such amazing things and really bring this language cluster and kind of continue its legacy of eight years really of where it's right. been going. So, um, but it's just been such a pleasure and it's been so much fun to work with too. And, um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to announce that our co-chairs for next year are going to be Roxanne Elliott. She might, yeah, she might be on Zoom. Um, Ana Ortega. Aoki. And again, continue with that interdisciplinary with linguist, Department of Linguistics, Spanish and Portuguese, and Education. So we're very great to have different departments. It'll be great to continue that on. And um, also, so we have a feedback survey that we would like to, we'll be emailing that to everybody. We want to know what worked, what didn't work, you know, any kind of feedback or suggestions that you have for future years. Definitely appreciate it. So go ahead and look for that in your inbox. And um, yeah, I mean, to close this out, um, I don't, we can mention uh, a lot more. Yeah, yeah, before, before we uh, leave it off to Claudia, I just mentioned it, it's on your programs uh, uh, in a little bit at 6 p.m., but since we're running a bit late, maybe give everybody a little bit more time. 6.30 p.m. at Woodstock. The address is on the uh, program and on the uh, uh, digital program and on the map and everything. Let us know if you have any questions. See you there. The map. The night is young, hopefully. <laughs> uh, and then just to talk about the night is young. We'll leave it to uh, Dr. Santa Gutierrez, the uh, advisor of the 
faster. <laughs> well, they really insisted on me talking, and I was like, I've done nothing, but okay, sure. <laughs> so here I am. So I just want to say that it's been pretty impressive. All of you have seen, like, suddenly there was food and then there were people managing each of the talks and then there was someone all the like yesterday and today solving all sorts of problems answering everyone and you can't imagine the work that's behind it it's been a year of work on the part of these amazing three women first so sophia bev anna thank you so much for your incredible work And also we had volunteer coordinators, which were like, who were like absolutely incredible. I was part of like volunteer training. Like we even had a volunteer training. Like can you believe that? It was like, okay, when you arrive to the room, you have all these things to do. And here's like, if anything goes wrong, call this person. So I mean, every single detail was prepared. So it all looked very like natural and all, but wow, no, there were like volunteering committees, like, you know. Uh, so thank you so much to the volunteer uh, coordinator. Of course, thank you so much to the whole uh, committee that's been working with our co-chairs to make this happen. It's uh, it's beautiful to see all these people in person after like two years, basically, of not seeing pretty much anyone. So thank you so much for making this possible. And yeah, see you next year. <laughs> Oh, we had some questions in the chat. Yeah, and then the long question, it was it was answered yeah. already. So it was like, uh, okay. so that was the only thing that was asked. That, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I'm so excited for this. Yeah, it was um, a couple of people, 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 people,